of the session, but I thought I would uh, put some slides together and provoke some discussion on the putative role of uh, brainwaves in um, computation and inference. I'm at the University of Newcastle here on beautiful Awabakal country. Uh, increasingly in Australia, we recognise the uh, Aboriginal people's country on uh, which we work and live. And uh, if you get the opportunity to travel to Australia and visit me, see just how beautiful it is here. Okay, got it. So um, I'm talking about traveling waves of oscillatory activity. And uh, over the last 10 to 15 years, such waves, and I'll show you a little bit more by what I mean, I have been as a, observed across species, across different cognitive functions in different cortical and subcortical areas, and uh, visible in different um, data modalities. Including <coughs> Reiki, the there's one thing, one window in front of the slides. Can you remove this? Aha, that'll be my speaker window, will it? That's uh, I can't read it. Build, build, order. build the order right. Okay, hang on, let me just. Uh... It's a gray little thing. It says no build effects. Oh, okay. It's on the right. Yes, there. Gone. Perfect. Now it's gone. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, um, so waves are in the brain and uh, by the principle of sufficient reason, which I discovered in Wikipedia, and this goes back to such luminaries as Schopenhauer, things that exist must have a reason. Uh, I realize this is not the best, uh, most principled way of scientific progress, uh, but nonetheless, I'm appealing uh, to this principle of sufficient reason that if waves exist, uh, then they must have a reason. And uh, I'm hoping that we'll have some uh, discussion about the role of cortical waves or waves of oscillatory activity in um, cognitive function. Um, now, just to step back from waves, since most of the waves that have been recorded and that I'm talking about are waves of oscillatory activity, I thought I'd just talk about the comput computational role of oscillations. Um, and there's many aspects I could pick to do this, but I just wanted to pick this beautiful picture from Kai Miller. Now, Kai actually presented this paper when he came to brain connectivity all the way back in 2007. And it's a notion of his that if you have a background weak rhythmic modulation coming into a cortical population, and that's the blue um, rhythmic modulation at the bottom of this neuron, um, what you do every time within every phase up and down, um, this slight partial depolarization that this rhythmic input does, uh, it, it affects, is to push the neuron up and down its gain function. So you go up to the blue and then down to the red. And as you see, when you go up to the blue, because it's a nonlinear gain function, you increase the gain. So at the height of the oscillation, at the height of the phase, uh, this weak mechanism um, increases the um, sensitivity of um, neurons to their um, stochastic inputs in their dendritic arbors. And every neuron that is receiving this rhythmic modulation will then be tuned to the same um, temporal inputs. Uh, this is um, others, including Pascal Fries and uh, um, have elucidated this, Ola Jensen, um, and I think it's a very nice principle. Uh, but why would these oscillations travel around the brain? And is, isn't this a bit crazy? We like to think that things in the brain are fairly well organized according to principles of um, segregation and integration. And if we've just got waves traveling around, um, wouldn't conscious experience uh, potentially be um, quite um, chaotic and unruly? Uh, one of the places where waves have been really well elucidated is in the hippocampus, where they seem to travel um, predominantly um, in one direction along the long hippocampal axis, 
Although I believe um, they do go up and down um, somewhat um, in both directions. This septotemporal component, others call it the head and the tail, others call it anterior and posterior. And you get these theta waves that this um, paper beautifully um, documented, um, I think about 10 years ago, yes, 2009. So we've got, uh, you know, if you go to the literature, you'll see quite a few papers on um, traveling waves of theta oscillations in the hippocampus. Now, work by uh, Buzaki and others preceding this had already focused on the role of theta oscillations per se in the hippocampus and shown in areas of, for example, parietal and prefrontal cortex, up to uh, 30, 30 to 40% of interneurons and 11 to 28% of pyramidal cells in their firing rate showed some statistical modulation to the hippocampal theta rhythm. So the theta rhythm in the hippocampus exerts quite a influence um, in tasks that engage the hippocampus on the firing rate of cortical neurons. And uh, the authors uh, of this Travelling Waves paper suggested this ensures that the distinct hippocampal targets receive peak um, neuronal input in a particular order. Uh, so as the waves go along, subcortical and cortical areas um, receive um, a, a sequence of inputs from the hippocampus. So if we just go back to uh, grid cells, um, or if we, we move to grid cells and place cells that have been studied extensively with the hippocampus, one other corollary of this is if you've got spatial resolution changing systematically along this axis, then the hippocampus waves are sort of scanning from fine to coarser spatial resolution. So at least, and, and, and I could go on and on about, and I'm sure many in the audience too, some of the functions of the hippocampus and, and start to see how these waves might um, embody a sort of sequence of, of interactions across the cortex and other targets of the hippocampus. What about other cortical regions? Well, one area I worked with uh, on a couple of years ago was the, uh, with Chird Bunstra and Stuart Heitman, was the role of beta oscillations in motor cortex. These are another canonical oscillation of the cortex, particularly in the, beta, in, in the motor cortex. And uh, these uh, seem to uh, tra traverse the motor cortex, um, uh, wherein these huge BET cells, the largest output cells of the cortex, have extensive dendritic arbors. And in this um, purely modeling paper, uh, some years ago, uh, Stuart Pulingong and I proposed that, and I think it's fairly plausible, if the dendrites of different um, BET cells have slightly anisotropic dendritic arbors in, in the sense of both the pyramidal and inhibitory inputs to those um, physical arbors, then these would actually act as a sort of spatiotemporal filter. And what we've shown in this um, schema is that traveling waves in one direction elicit beta oscillations and rhythmic output, which is consistent with empirical observations, whereas traveling waves in the orthogonal um, direction uh, are kind of invisible to this uh, putative BET cell. Um, now, traveling waves don't just have to be in fronts. In, in models, you can have the waves break up into little bumps and the bumps can stay still or they can start to move. And um, moving bumps, just like the game of life, uh, can compute. And I won't go into the details here because you either love and know the game of life or not. Um, but in this particular paper, Pulling Gong and uh, myself um, showed how collisions of these bumps can encode sort of Boolean logic, um, A and B, A or B, A and not B, according to whether the direction of the bumps are perturbed or not. And when you add noise, then you kind of get back to some sort of prob probabilistic computation. Um, it's all very abstract, but I, I, I put it out there because I think it's um, 
just kind of interesting. Now, what about large scale models? Um, you may know that a number of us, Gustavo, myself, Petra, uh, Peter Robinson, of course, have been looking at large scale models of the brain. Uh, in this sort of toy model, um, <clears throat> we put a little uh, chaotic oscillator in, in, in to represent the neural mass uh, behavior of a small patch of neuron. Then we cover the cortex in these neural oscillators, and then we connect them uh, through um, our best guess of the, um, in this case, human connect home. And uh, we can then put them into a computational platform like the virtual brain. Um, or into something that you can um, hack together yourself and propagate these models forward in time. Um, and um, boom, bada boom, um, you get these uh, self-organizing whole brain uh, wave patterns. These are, are rotating waves. Uh, after a few um, minutes, they spontaneously traverse into different wave patterns. Here's a breather. Um, and um, here's a traveling wave. And we uh, documented and saw all these sort of waves. They're a form of metastability in the sense that they just uh, cycle from one wave type to the next, to the next, to the next, even in the absence of noise. But I'm not going to go into any more detail than that here. Um, just to say, uh, you know, to first, pass, these waves, large-scale waves, are, are not unlike the sort of waves that have been recorded in human cortex. Here's a paper from um, Lyle Muller, who I think is with Petra now, and Terry Sanowski in eLife, looking at uh, sleep spindles, human electrocorticograms. Here's our little toy model, or... Um, uh, tied it up to, to have the same sort of temporal coverage of, of their data. And we see a sort of oscillatory component and perhaps even a wavelength, and I'll come back to that, uh, that is um, the first effort uh, comparable to that that's been empirically observed. Now, uh, it's not really magic that these waves arise. Uh, the connectome, as we've looked at through the work of um, pioneers like Olaf, Spawns and others, uh, has a very particular architecture. But if you just uh, take um, this uh, average over the whole connectome of, um, for example, here, um, log of the edge weight or streamline count or some other measure of connection density against distance, uh, you get a sort of um, exponential-like drop-off, or maybe it's a Bessel function. Uh, it's not a perfect uh, exponential, it's a very noisy one, and uh, mathematicians refer to this as a sort of frozen noise, and it injects some stochasticity into the system. And then you get these long-range connections that are stronger than the background effect. So uh, it's not surprising to get waves. Uh, but the waves arise, the nature of the right waves reflects a whole bunch of things, including the cortical geometry, the local oscillators that you choose, and of course, the uh, nature of this synaptic footprint. And uh, we really dug into the underlying dynamics here, but I won't go into that. But what's, what's kind of encouraging is the models uh, make predictions. For example, we've got from the top line here, predicted um, uh, speed of the models, of, of, of the waves from the model, both the waves and looking at the distribution of the speed across different nodes. And um, in the bottom row on the right here, we see some um, empirical measurements from the hippocampus uh, and um, what you can see is our model is out by an order of um, one magnitude. And I don't really care about that because this was just a proof of principle model. But the fact that you can start to get these empirical metrics means that we can potentially uh, inf invert uh, generative models and use the mismatch between the model and the data as a, a penalty. Um, okay, so for discussion. Uh, waves are cool. Um, I like to think they are. Uh, they occur. 
and then therefore by the famous German philosopher Schopenhauer, they must have a reason. Uh, they rise very naturally. Um, they can compute, the game of life apparently can compute um, pi, um, and, and potentially they can be inverted from data. The model that I'm showing here is a really simple model of um, uh, oscillators uh, on a sphere. And these cool patterns on the left are called chimera states. Um, and we can also see them if we look in more detail at our more biophysical models on the brain. Uh, the brain is a wave machine, I have to say, uh, lacks the sophistication, theoretical depth, philosophical underpinnings and neurobiological mirroring um, of the Helmholtz machine um, that um, uh, no doubt many of us have heard from um, from Carl and others. Um, so uh, I'd like to just uh, thank my group. Here we are at our retreat and some of the funders, um, but go back and um, uh, hopefully I've left uh, sufficient time for some discussion.